All right, today I want to talk about the quintessential weapon, which has ruled supreme on the battlefield throughout most of human history. The pointy stick. So, spears. Right. Now you can actually see the important part. I want to talk specifically about spearheads. Not so much about the haft, because there isn't that much to say. I mean, it needs to be good, strong wood, straight and well-shaped, thick enough. That's about it. There's more variation with regards to the spearhead. Nowhere near as much variation, though, as you would see in swords, for instance. If you look at spear typologies, Depending on the time frame and the region, yeah, you will see some su substantial differences, but you won't see anywhere near as many subtypes as you have with swords, and you won't see as much variation from one century to the next, say. In general, you could distinguish between round and angular spearheads. Uh, the round ones are quite often leaf blades. There are also different ways of mounting them. Sockets are the most common, I would say. Tangs are more typical on earlier spearheads, so anything up to early Middle Ages. After that, it was pretty much socketed all the way, at least in Europe. In other places, you may find uh, tang or other construction methods as well. And so when we look at the shapes, it's easy to jump to conclusions about how they were supposed to be used. Like, for example, armor piercing tips. Like, if you look at something like this, which is a throwing spear or javelin, or arguably that's a different type as opposed to a regular spear. But again, you can get bogged down too much in over-classifying because spears that were thrown could also be used in you know, melee combat and vice versa. So in this case, you have a an angular and pretty narrow point that tapers noticeably, and it's got this diamond cross section. This you would think armor piercing, similar to botkin points on arrows, but this one here in particular is not useful for that at all. Back in 2015, I did some tests with it, throwing it against a very crude approximation of light armor. So essentially some padding with several layers of leather. And this did very, very little, simply because it's really light. You can see it's quite a small point. It's a rather thin shaft. It wouldn't really penetrate mail terribly well unless it's thrown with extreme force and even then the lightweight limits how much it can do. This spear on the other hand would be a lot more powerful in both the throw and a thrust because there is quite a bit more mass and uh, this doesn't really fit in the uh, rounded versus angular classification which I just made out by the way I don't think that's official. So this is what is this I mean it's almost angular but it's a little rounded so you know every time you try to come up with rules to classify something there's going to be exceptions and it's going to be gray area and all of that it's just the nature of it now uh, this one here is relatively thick and you can see the central ridge is fairly pronounced so that makes it very rigid you cannot bend this point at all it's all massive which is exactly what you want for powerful thrusts and so this could pierce armor, yeah. Depends on the type of armor against a, a well-made hardened breastplate, not so much. I mean, it could probably punch a hole in, but it wouldn't really get deep enough to cause substantial damage to the wearer underneath. This is a reproduction of a spear from the 12th century. And at that time, the types of armor you would encounter on the battlefield were mainly cloth armor male coat of plates toward the end of the 12th century, but uh, plate armor became common later. So against male, this does quite well. I've done some tests with it, and yeah, it does its job. This, The point is narrow enough that it can get into a ring and spread it apart, 
or slip in between rings and, and break the structure open. So that works quite well. From the Bronze Age, you see mainly fairly wide leaf blade spearheads, but sometimes you see quite narrow ones too, like this one here. In general, it's easy to jump to the conclusion that every shape is dictated by its function and just by its function. Like when you look at a leaf blade, you can think, okay, so this is designed to produce a wide wound without penetrating too far, because as it it gets wider and wider, you encounter more resistance in the thrust and it's not going to penetrate as deeply as a narrower point with the same kind of force. So you can, you can think that, well, that's there to prevent over penetration because you don't want to run somebody through all the way with the entire spear so that all of the head just comes out the back because if you didn't need to uh, extract it, it may get stuck, it may bend or break in the process, and then you're left without a weapon on the battlefield. And later spears, like this one here, have these wings to prevent exactly that, to stop the overpenetration, to make sure that it goes no further than this, and you can still fairly easily extracted. Another reason is for use in hunting, specifically boar hunting. If one of those suckers gets really pissed off and just charges at you with a lot of momentum, even if you impale it, it might still continue the rush and just run all the way up the shaft and still get you. So the wings or lugs would prevent that from happening, hopefully. <laughs> I would argue that generally when you see barbs or hooks on a spear, it's probably not a battlefield spear or, you know, for, for fighting in general, more likely to be a hunting spear because in the context of hunting, you do not need to extract the spear right away. And in fact, when it comes to uh, spear fishing, for example, you need those hooks obviously to catch fish. And in case of a thrown spear with barbs, it may stick in the, in the animal and encumber and hinder it as it tries to get away all of that. That's something that you don't necessarily want in battle unless it's a thrown spear. In that case, absolutely. The Germanic Ango or Angon is a good example. It was used as a throwing spear or javelin by the Franks and other groups, and it commonly had barbs or hooks. You would hope that it gets stuck in something, either in an enemy's body or a shield, and it will give them all kinds of trouble and prevent them from fighting effectively. So I would say most of the time when you see really pronounced hooks or barbs, probably for throwing or hunting in general, not so much for fighting hand to hand with a spear. Now, if you look at the Old Norse sagas, there is a mention of a krogspjod. Krokar means hooks. And so this could refer to a barbed spear. It could also be a winged spear, you know, like this type. So there are several different interpretations. It's not quite clear exactly what that's referring to, and they could be used for actively hooking. So when you have uh, wings or hooks or something like that on the spear, this may allow you to control an opponent's spear or sword, secure a bind, pull the weapon aside, uh, perhaps wrench a shield, things like that. So it could potentially be used for that. And of course, it could be multi-purpose as well. It could prevent over-penetration and be useful for hooking, etc. So whenever you see giant fantasy spears with massive downward points, those would not be practical in real life. Uh, thrown would make some sense, but it depends on just how extreme it is. If you have really giant points that flare out a lot, then it would most likely stop there. So at that point, what is the point? So you have superfluous point, pointless points. <sighs> what am I doing? This, by the way, is a hewing spear from the Viking Age. This is very suitable for cuts as well. You can cut with any spear, really, even if it's a relatively short blade. But of course, this is going to be much more effective than that in the cut. But it's not just the length, it's also the blade geometry. This one here is wide and relatively thin. 
Uh, this one here is more narrow and thick. So this is not very suitable for cuts. If you look at typologies or just in general examples from different places and time periods, you can definitely see local flavor, so to speak, like uh, this Igorot war spear or this Javanese spear. Uh, they are noticeably different from comparable European uh, spear shapes, but they are not drastically different. There are, however, also pretty uh, unique cases, like this spear from 16th to 19th century Java. Uh, yeah, this is uh, certainly a little more unique. Uh, with some finds, of course, there's always the question, was this actually intended for battle or was it ornamental slash ceremonial slash what have you. There's a South Indian spear that would fit perfectly in a fantasy scenario. Really the only difference is it's not completely oversized, but certainly an unusual shape. And uh, here's a very pretty example from Turkey, 16th century. There are a few general things to consider when shaping a spearhead. Uh, for one, if you want maximum penetration, stop giggling, you want a narrow blade that is pretty thick and stiff. If you want to limit over penetration, you can either put wings on it or you can widen it quite substantially toward the socket. Well, that can be useful if the, the, the purpose is to make the target bleed out rather than cause damage to internal organs and all that. Don't demonetize me, YouTube. This is all theoretical talk. I do not encourage anybody to. <sighs> Never mind. And if you wanted to deliver effective cuts as well, a lenticular cross section is better with a fairly wide blade, but thin. So yeah, that's about it. There's always more to talk about, of course, but I uh, just wanted to cover the basics of spears and um, hope you found it interesting. Thanks for watching and have a good one, folks. Also, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Mm -hmm.